You know, Chad, you've been our lead pastor for 25 years. Which makes, so this makes us old. Er, <laughs> <laughs> older than some, not as old as others. But one of the things that through this 25 years that uh, I would say that people would look at Calvary and say, wow, you guys have been successful. So here, here's my first question for you since I get to do the interviewing today. I love this, right? What is Chad's recipe? And I want to preface this by saying recipe. Every good restaurant has what we call a lead chef or a head chef, right? That makes that signature dish that brings everybody continually back again, right? Well, Chad's been our lead chef as our lead <clears throat> shepherd here and so my question is, what's your recipe for success, Chad? Uh, great question. I'm going to start by just inviting everyone to take a Bible or their Bible app and turn to Proverbs chapter 3. Uh, Proverbs 3, and if you don't have a Bible with you, grab one of the Bibles in the seats around you, turn to page 627, and you will find uh, Proverbs 3. But uh, while you're finding that, it's, so, it's just weird to be thinking in terms of, hey, what's your recipe for success? Because... Growing up, uh, my identity was uh, a loser. And, and uh, you know, that just was kind of uh, how I saw myself when I looked in the mirror. And, and I don't know how you see yourself when you look in the mirror, but a lot of times uh, we, we get an identity that kind of sticks with us and it kind of becomes uh, written on our soul or our core. And, and so uh, I know God has done amazing things at Calvary. I know the, this church, by any measure that you look at it, is successful. And, uh, and so, but it just always seems strange to think, oh yeah, what's, what, have, what have we done? So uh, Proverbs chapter 3, uh, beginning at verse 3, I think has uh, a lot of the answers in it in terms of success and what it means. Solomon writes, let not steadfast love and faithfulness forsake you. Bind them around your neck, write them on the tablet of your heart, so you will find favor and good success in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make straight your paths. Uh, God is the source of, of anything that can be called success uh, in my life and it's true in anybody's life. But here's the, the recipe, if you will. Uh, I got four ingredients for uh, what I think is, is success in terms of what the Bible says. First of all, if you want to be successful, be biblical. Be biblical. Trust in the Lord. Don't lean on your own understanding. So read the Bible, study the Bible, memorize scripture. Let God's wisdom soak into your soul. I mean, that's why we give Bibles away here at Calvary, because we want you to have the word of God and read the word of God, because we know if you do that, it will change your life. And so I just encourage people to do that uh, because we've all got opinions. I've got opinions. Chet's got a couple opinions, sure. uh, and you guys all have opinions. And here's the thing, if we live by our opinions, I think we're going to fail. Yep. But yep. if we live by God's wisdom, then we're going to succeed. And, and I'll just tell you straight up, the, the most significant decision I made and, and the most influential part of my life in terms of its direction and, and, and impact is the Bible. Hmm is living by the Bible, learning the Bible, loving the Bible, knowing the Bible. Uh, that's, uh, that's the most important thing I've done. So if you want to be successful, be biblical. Secondly, be on mission. Be on mission. Jesus commissioned all of us to be on mission. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, and by that I mean you believe that Jesus is the one and only Son of God and Savior of the world. You believe that he died on the cross to pay for your sins and was raised from the dead, and you've made a commitment to follow Jesus with your life, then Jesus has already commissioned you, invited you, sent you on a mission. And, uh, and my mission is to be the pastor of Calvary, but you're on mission wherever you are, whether you're in school or whether you're at work or whether you're hanging out with your friends or whether you're in a civic club, you're on mission to influence for Jesus. So here's my reality. Uh, Jesus Christ changed my life. Mm -hmm. He changed my life. He gave me value. He gave me wisdom. He gave me direction. He gave me purpose. I am forgiven of my sins because of Jesus. I am adopted by Jesus. And my life is defined by Jesus. 
And so I want every single person that I meet to know the grace of God that I have discovered. I want them to meet the Savior that has changed my life because I know that God can redeem their life, restore their life, heal their life, change their life if they will let him do that. And so uh, that's what drives me. And, and I believe that the more that you seek to connect your life to the mission of Christ, then the more successful you're going to be. Uh, so uh, be biblical, be on mission. Uh, thirdly, be generous. Be generous. Jesus said, give and it will be given to you. For the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. He also said it's more blessed to give than to receive. So how many of us think it's good to listen to Jesus? Yeah, see, most of the hands go up because we're in church. We go, oh yeah, Jesus is cool. Jesus is great. Jesus is awesome. Well, uh, here's the thing. I believe in Jesus, so I want to grow in generosity. I want to become more generous and, and understand. I grew up in churches. Let's see, I was this. How many of you grew up going to church all the time? Oh, yeah. Lots of hands. Okay. So I grew up in church, and I know the churches Chet grew up in were similar to mine. And, and, and we learned to give because our parents gave right. and because they taught giving in our churches. Right. And we knew that uh, we had to give to be good Christians. Right. Obedience. Yeah. So we gave out of obedience but as an adult, what I've learned is that God's power is unleashed in our generosity. Mm -hmm. I mean, God's, it's amazing what God does when his people step into generosity and start living out generosity. And, and here's what happens. When we're generous, the grace of God is demonstrated for a greedy, materialistic, overindulgent world. And we confront the selfishness and greed that's in us when we practice the grace of giving. And so uh, I believe that if you want to be successful, you need to be generous. Mm -hmm. But here's the, the caveat I'd put on that. We need to be generous according to God, not according to us. Because a lot of times we think, well, compared to my cheap brother-in-law, I'm really generous. <laughs> compared to my friend, I'm really generous. And it doesn't matter if you're comparing it to the wrong standard. God's the standard, and he invites us to give and give generously, and so make sure that you're generous by God's definition. Mm -hmm. Proverbs eleven twenty five, 25, by the way, says, The one who refreshes others will himself be refreshed. Amen. Amen. So, great, great idea. So, uh, be biblical, be on mission, be generous. The last ingredient is be joyful. Be joyful. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16, the Apostle Paul says, Rejoice always. Rejoice always. Here, say that with me. Rejoice, Rejoice always. always. You guys just memorized a verse of Scripture. Woohoo! See, and some of you thought you couldn't memorize Scripture anymore. You may not remember that it's in 1 Thessalonians 5, but you know the verse. Rejoice yeah. always. And uh, again, going back to the churches that we grew up in, Chet, we grew up in churches where, uh, and hung out with Christian leaders that uh, I think undervalued joy. They undervalue joy. And, and, and here's how you knew that. Because if you were having too much fun, you were not serious. And you need to get more serious because the Bible's serious. And, and you need to grow up and get mature. And they considered people who were mm -hmm. joyful to be immature. Right. Um, they made a mistake of telling us to read the Bible, though. That's true. And uh, so we started reading the Bible. And guess what? The fruit of the Holy Spirit is Come on. Come on. love, joy, joy. Uh, second one, isn't that cool? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Joy is one of the fruit of the Holy Spirit. It's one of the things he's going to produce in your life if you get close to him, if you give him control. And so it is a sign of maturity, not a sign of immaturity. And so the people who are serious all the time need to grow up. Amen. And they need to get joy. Come on. So um, <laughs> I, think, I think we're working pretty good on that, aren't we? So... So here's the deal. I want to celebrate yeah. all the time. I want to celebrate life change because Jesus has changed my life and, and I love to hear how Jesus has changed your life. In fact, the best thing about my job, best thing about our job, we talk yes. about it all the time. Yep. We get to hang out with you guys and hear how God is working in your life. And of course, then we want you to tell other people and want to make videos and stuff. And a lot of you are a little bit hesitant to do that, so repent. But um, I'm... Hey, look, you've got great stories. You've got great stories of life change. We, gonna, we wanna celebrate those stories. We wanna celebrate, I wanna celebrate anyway, uh, the mercy of God. That I'm a sinner who deserves hell and I get heaven. 
I want to celebrate uh, my family. I want to celebrate the wife of my youth. I want to celebrate the blessings of God. I want to celebrate the victory we have in Christ. Mm. So here, here's my question. How are we not joyful? How are we not joyful? There's not one of us who's a follower of Jesus Christ who's going to get what we deserve. I mean, guys, we deserve hell. We're going to get heaven. Mm. That alone is reason to rejoice always. Yep. That's why Paul said rejoice always. Yep. And, and so get this. We are loved by God. We are forgiven by God. We are adopted as sons and daughters of God. And I believe if we really live a life of celebration and joy in, in the world that is completely consumed with anger and anxiety and fear, that we are going to challenge people to embrace Jesus. I think if we, really, if we really get the joy piece down, then, then we're like a magnet for Jesus. People go, I want, I want what they have. Proverbs uh, puts it this way. And, and by the way, you guys know I love Proverbs. Proverbs 15, 15. I think this is Chet's new favorite one. All the days of the afflicted are evil, but the cheerful of heart has a continual feast. Yes! Isn't that cool? A continual feast if yep. you're cheerful of heart. And, and maybe you're a little bit more into the, instead of food into medicine, but Proverbs 17, 22 says, a cheerful heart is good medicine. So uh, that's kind of my recipe for success. Be biblical, be on mission, be generous, be joyful. That sounds like a great meal, great <laughs> recipe. It's, hey, that's why you're here, right? Amen. So here, here's another question for you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to divide this into two um, for doing most of the time um, when people say what have you learned how did you get where you are what are you successful at we gave the recipe there but for me most of the time unfortunately I learn best when I make mistakes I don't know about the rest of you guys but but God seems to teach me in that way mm -hmm. so so here's the first part of the question is the leader is the visionary for Calvary what has God taught you and then the second part of that actually you can answer it first what do you lament in this process mm. 25 years of being our lead pastor you know uh the lament question is is really uh easy to answer because it's uh in the in the 25 years you know god's added a lot of people uh but there's also been people that that have uh, walked away right. from the church and and uh Every time we do a major change, uh, there's some people who don't like what we change, and so they find another mm -hmm. church to go to. And, and you guys are family, and so when, when that happens, I grieve that. Mm -hmm. We grieve that. And so that's hard, and, and we still want to bless people. And, and, but the, the probably more painful one are the people who walk away uh, from God. Right. They decide that they're going to be a prodigal. Uh, they decide that they aren't going to believe what we're inviting them to step into, and so they walk away. And I know there's going to be pain and heartache and brokenness there because God has the power to redeem, uh, and, and I want to see that happen. So that's, that's what I lament. Uh, what, what has God taught me? Uh, I'm going to summarize it in two words that are found in Proverbs 3, 3 and 4. Look at these two verses again. You know, the, the real popular, famous verses are verses 5 and 6. I mean, it's graduation season. Half the Christian graduation cards are going to have these verses on them. A lot of you write them down because you love these verses. But look at verses 3 and 4. God really revealed these to me uh, not too long ago, and, and they were always there. I just didn't see them. <laughs> uh, he says, Let not steadfast love and faithfulness forsake you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart so you will find favor and good success in the sight of God and man. Let love and faithfulness never leave you. Love and faithfulness. That, those are the things that if you really uh, uh, lean into are going to change your life in incredibly positive ways. Uh, think about this. The two words, love. Now, our world loves love. They love the idea of love. And you know, they glorify love. They idolize it in all the wrong ways. Because they portray love as a feeling. So you're going to look for your soulmate and fall in love with them. But then if you can fall in love, you stumble into it like a, a puddle or something. You can get out of it, too. Uh, and that's not how God represents love. Love is a, an action that God commands us to do. It's not a feeling he commands us to have. And so we know Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. It's the first and great commandment. The second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Right. And, and so he's not telling you how to feel. He's at, at, 
tell us how to act. And I believe that when you boil love down, it, it is simply the action to bless someone. Right. It's acting to bless. So, you know, to love God is to bless God. What does it mean to bless God? It means to obey God. What does it mean to, you know, bless the people that you love in your life? Because uh, we use the word, we say I love you, but that could be the most beautiful or the most meaningless phrase ever. Mm. Mm. Uh, think about it. The Apostle Paul said love is patient and love is kind. If you tell me that you're patient while you're yelling and screaming at me. Yeah, it ain't going to work. Yeah, it's kind of empty words. Mm -hmm. If you try to tell me that you're a kind person while you're being rude to the waiters and waitresses in the restaurant you go to after church, I'm not going to believe you. And if you say that you love me and you don't act to bless me, I'm not sure that your words have any value. Mm -hmm. And so uh, are you acting to bless? Are you acting to bless your family? You know, guys, are you acting to bless your wife? You know, are you acting to bless your children? Are the, the, I want to bless the, the leaders here at Calvary. I want to bless the, the members here at Calvary. I want to bless you. I want to bless the, the community. I want, I want us to bless the kingdom of God. And, and so to do that means that we take actions that are going to benefit other people, not just uh, use words. So let love and faithfulness never leave you. Faithfulness, like love, can be really nebulous. Sometimes people just think it's faithful just to show up. Well, I was there. I was faithful. But I think it's more than that. I think faithfulness, first of all, has to do with integrity. Yeah. That we are who we say we are. That, that we are honest and we are transparent and we are accountable because we are consistent in our lives. And, and here at Calvary, character is one of our values, our core values. We believe that you cannot represent Jesus unless you reflect his character. And, and so f integrity is part of faithfulness. The other side of faithfulness, I think, is endurance. Endurance. Uh, endurance is the building block of character. The Apostle Paul says, rejoice in your sufferings because suffering produces endurance and endurance produces character and character produces hope and hope doesn't disappoint. And, and so, uh, you know, God wants us to endure. And truth is, in 25 years, there were times I wanted to quit Calvary. I didn't want to quit ministry. I just wanted to be someplace else. <laughs> I wanted God, you know, God, can I move on? And he'd say no. And at the point in time when I was asking that, I was frustrated. But guess what? God's plan was better than Chad's plans. Mm -hmm. And I am so thankful that God said no. I'm so thankful that God said stay because he blessed me beyond anything I ever imagined or dreamed. So uh, at, at Calvary on, on staff, we, we talk about it in these terms. And, and I have to preface this by just saying as a disclaimer, neither Chet nor myself are runners. Amen. Okay. I mean, I ran once, didn't like it, so I decided to give it up. Uh, but uh, Unless something's chasing me, that's about the only thing. No, you're going to turn around. I'm going to trip turn, you so they'll catch you and I get away. I thought, I thought you'd just turn around and shoot it. But, um, but we use this phrase because we are in the race following Jesus and we're in the race of ministry of leading men and women to life-changing relationship with Jesus. And we talk about it all the time in terms of we're in a marathon, mm. not a sprint. That's right. And that's really how life is. It's a marathon, it's not a sprint. You know, if we sprinted all the time, we'd burn out, we'd get Quick. exhausted, we wouldn't have anything to offer people. And so we try to find that, that pace so that we can persevere to win. And sometimes that just means just keeping one foot going in front of the other. It's endurance. And, and this applies to everything. We, we use it a lot of times in terms of sharing the gospel with people in the community. Because we'll say, hey, you know, they're not a believer in Jesus Christ. Yet. Yet. And we know that they're in process. And, and that God is at work. So, uh, but endurance applies to your marriage. That, you know, it's so tempting to want to quit. But if you endure, God's going to redeem and he's going to heal and he's going he's to make it better. It, it's true with your children. You know, it, it may seem like, the, you know, they're never going to grow up, but they're going to grow up in a blink, and you're going to want to have a relationship with them as adults. Hopefully, they're going to want to come hang out with you. It, it's true with your career. It's true with your character. Uh, integrity and endurance equal faithfulness. So let love and faithfulness never leave you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Literally, tattoo them on your soul, and you will find favor and success before God and men. That's kind of a cool promise. So that's what God's taught me. Well, thanks for sharing. Uh, we, we could be here forever. Hmm. 
learning the lessons that God has taught each one of us. Another one of Calvary's core values is change. We believe that it is impossible to follow Jesus Christ and stay the same. Mm -hmm. Well, that is developed out of the vision that our lead pastor, Chad Garrison, has, not only for his staff, but for everyone that he encounters. He's not okay with anybody staying where they are. He wants them to face God. He wants God to grow them. And so one of the things that I really admire about being on the team with Chad is that Chad is a, a great visionary. He, he gets away and he hears from God, and then he comes and shares that vision uh, with the team, and then we share that vision with you, and, and God helps that happen. So, <clears throat> Chad, here's my final question for you. What vision has God given you for next concerning Calvary? Mm -hmm. What next? Hey, uh, just in, in general, understand that as followers of Jesus Christ, the best is yet to come. Mm. The best is yet to come for every single one of us because heaven's ahead of us. So wherever you are in life, whatever difficulties you're facing, just know that the best is still ahead. Um, and, and so I am incredibly thankful and honestly surprised by the blessings of God at Calvary, the way that the church has grown, the impact and influence that God has given us on our community. It, it's incredible. I, I was never, I didn't see that coming. But, uh, but I got to be honest, I'm more excited about what is ahead than what's behind. I mean, I praise God for the really cool stuff he's done at Calvary through the 25 years, but I'm praising God for what is coming next. So I just want to encourage you to get ready. You know, our mission field is Lake Havasu City, and there are 40,000 or so unchurched people in Lake Havasu. And uh, we're on this mission to lead them to a life-changing relationship with Jesus. So here's a couple of things that I really see for what's next. The first one is just captured in one word, serve. Mm. Serve. We are expanding our ministry to the community, uh, and we've been doing that for a couple of years, and it's just going to grow more and more now that we're in the Sweetwater campus uh, because we spent so much energy getting here. Uh, now we're going to turn that energy and, and focus more outwardly. And I know we do a lot of stuff already, but get ready for some bigger stuff. So a couple of things right ahead of us that are brand new. Uh, first of all is our Serve Our Schools project. We want to lead our community to bless all eight of our public schools, our two charter schools, with a thousand volunteers doing a hundred projects on October 7th, 2017. So that's just a few months away. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you know what I just heard? I just heard volunteers. <laughs> this Identifying this themselves. This service alone could take care of that. That's true. But, and, and see, a 1,000 volunteers, but I, I think 500 of those are going to come out of Calvary. There you go. I, I think we're going to lead our community in doing this, and, uh, uh, and, and that's going to impact our community. But, but out of this project that we were talking to, because we met with the administration of the district, we met with the principals. Uh, I was having a conversation with the principal at Thunderbolt, and, uh, and I said, hey, have you, are you excited about the, the project list? You got your projects? And she said, not really, because what we really need is our classrooms painted. Mm. And we can't do that, you know, during the school year because teachers put stuff all over the walls. And uh, it'd have to be in the summer. And I went, well, how many classrooms do you have? <laughs> Forty classrooms is what they have at Thunderbolt. And I went, okay, let me see what I can do. And, uh, and what I wanted to say was, oh, that's too bad. Uh, <laughs> But I, I decided to talk to some of our, you know, painters that are connected to the church and kind of had to make a look at it. Anyway, uh, we've committed July 10th through the 21st to paint the classrooms at Thunderbolt. And uh, yeah, more volunteers. I love this. You guys are dialed in. And, and what I figured is, you know, 40 classrooms, what we need is, you know, some of you that know how to paint to get you know, three or four of your friends together and you guys commit to one classroom and all we need then is 200 volunteers and it's all done. done. Piece of cake. So, uh, you know, start praying about that. Be available. Don't plan a vacation now during those times. Or if you do, you know, just give us a day. And uh, so we're going to serve. And see, here's the thing. By us serving our community, those 40,000 people, most of them are never going to set foot in our church. I mean, you guys are awesome about inviting your friends and bringing your neighbors and your coworkers, but a lot of them just aren't going to come to church until they get to know us up close because we're serving the community, until they get to see the joy that's in our lives, until they experience the generosity uh, firsthand that we're engaged in, uh, then that's going to be life-changing for them. And so uh, we're going to serve. And we're just going to get bigger and bigger on, on the serve. And by the way, if you've got a crazy idea about how we can serve Lake Havasu City, 
share it with us. Because, you know, it doesn't matter if it's crazy. If God's in it, we'll, we'll take it on. We'll see what we can do. Uh, and, uh, and we love crazy ideas anyway. Now, we didn't say we would do the crazy ideas. We no. said we would entertain That's true. hearing about them. And bless you to do those crazy <laughs> ideas. And we'll come along with the halfway same ones. Yeah, we, okay. we can. Just clarify. So, yeah, they just, they just heard me confess to my, yeah. my crazy. So, yeah, there's some really hopeful people yep. out there. Um, so the second big thing that's uh, ahead of us that I want to share with you is satellite campuses. Yeah. Satellite campuses. We have been in uh, the Sweetwater campus just two weeks short of one year. And uh, let me just tell you what God has done. Uh, the 12 months prior to us occupying the Sweetwater campus, on our McCulloch campus, we had five worship services, and we averaged uh, just over 1,400 people uh, each weekend. Uh, for the one year we've been in Sweetwater, 50 weeks actually that we've been in Sweetwater, we have averaged over 1,800 people a weekend. Ooh, and uh, yeah, isn't that, isn't that awesome? Amen. That's because you guys are so good about bringing your friends. Uh, and so here's the reality. We're going to outgrow this facility sooner rather than later. Mm -hmm. And so our plan is that we're going to add, you know, satellite services over at the McCulloch campus. We're going to, you know, renovate that, bring the technology up to speed uh, so that it matches here and, and offer maybe a little different style or whatever. But, but we're going to offer services there at McCulloch as well as here. And then we started thinking, well, you know, it's not just like Havasu City, but there are communities around us that are underserved by strong, biblical, healthy, growing churches. And, and maybe up the river and down the river, they might need some, you know, faith communities too that are like this. So there's a possibility of us, if God opens those doors of having satellite campuses, maybe in Bullhead, maybe in Parker, someone from Kingman was at the last service and lobbying for there. And we Come have on. no idea what God would have us to do. We just want to be obedient right. to whatever doors he opens to fulfill his mission mm. for his kingdom. So uh, those are a couple of, of what next that I see. Let me ask this question. What's next for your life? What's next for you? What does God want you to do for his kingdom? What habit or addiction or sin does God want you to break free from? What character trait is God trying to teach you right now? And how are you going to build your life? What's your recipe for success? And, and if you don't like what you've been cooking up, Understand, it's never too late to start following Jesus. It's never too late to let him redeem your life, change your direction, because he is in the life-changing business. And if you build your life God's way, it will succeed. Amen. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will direct your paths. Amen. Will you pray with me?